right. We're going to do a little review today for exam one on chapter one, two, and three. And I will start off my reviews with, i give you guys the floor in case there's some burning issue that we need to get to because I want to be sure and get all of yours covered before I start chattering on. And that usually means uh, the homework problems. If you have any questions about those? Let's see, where are they? In my notes, I only have the answer to, so I'm not sure what the question is. You'll have to tell me that. If, if one of them is bothering you, you want to deal with it. Um, and my, Brian, this last week, my question is just like, give me a very brief summary of the exam. But okay. I heard it was just a periodic table. Oh, last week's? Yeah, last week. Last week, okay. What the chapter and everything was about. It was like any standout details that I needed to like, know. Refresh my memory. Yeah. Been a lot of water under the bridge since then. Let's say chapter three was on atomic structure and periodic table. Okay. Right. Okay, so I'll, let me identify this as chapter three. Video. Um, parts of an atom. We know that um, the name atom means you can't cut it any further. H, H almost means my cut. But that's true if you want to have the element. Anything below that is not the element anymore. But the atom does have parts. Okay. So we know from uh, Rutherford's gold foil experiment that the atom is a is a, a nuclear object, which means most of the mass is in a small central region. And it's got at least a proton, which is the case in hydrogen. Anything above hydrogen will have neutrons also in that dense center. Protons and neutrons are approximately the same mass. Neutrons edge it out just a little bit heavier, but not much. And then all the electrons occur out here. And their mass is about uh, 18, 37 or 73, that fraction of a proton. So they're really, really small. They virtually have no mass. So <clears throat> when we write an element, um, this is your generic element, just a reminder. Remember, there are four positions around that symbol, and they're reserved for specific information. This position down here, lower left-hand corner, we designate as C, is the atomic number. Okay. That's equal to C. And it's also equal to the number of protons. Okay. When the atomic number was, was first devised, uh, it was a whole number, but it wasn't originally associated with the number of protons. That came later. Um, and this position, designated A, is equal to the number of protons plus the number of and that's equal to the mass number. It will always be a whole number. This will be a whole number, that will be a whole number. Okay. And in a neutral atom, uh, if there's no charge, that's where the charge goes. Of course, if there's no charge, we usually don't write anything. <clears throat> but if it's a neutral atom, then the number of protons equals the number of electrons. And because positives and negatives cancel. So if you have the equal numbers, you've got a neutral atom. Okay, and that's what you'll find 
with any of the elements in their natural state, uh, what we call ground state, uh, at say room temperature and one atmosphere pressure, um, they will always be neutral. Even if they happen to be diatomic, like oxygen, nitrogen, or chlorine, or hydrogen. <clears throat> Even though they're diatomic, they're still neutral and each atom has its own uh, atomic number and we'll get to the mass number in a minute because it can vary but, but the atomic number is unique for each element if you know the atomic number you know the element all you have to do is go to the periodic table and look it up and they're they're numbered from from top down left right they get bigger so hydrogen up there in the upper left hand corner only has one proton. And then we have to introduce the concept of isotopes. Let's see, did I do that in here? Okay. Yeah. So what's an isotope? An isotope is the same element but it has a different mass number. And most elements have at least two isotopes. And the mass number, since it's a combination of protons and neutrons, the only thing that can change for that element to make it heavier or lighter is the number of neutrons. Because what happens if you change the number of protons? You get a different element. So the mass number is different for isotopes because of the different number of neutrons. Okay. So hydrogen, let's just take hydrogen. The most common isotope for hydrogen has, of course, this one and a mass number of one because that's just one proton. Okay. But it, if it has a neutron, that's a one proton, one neutron means two but it still has one proton. And then the uh, hydrogen bomb version is tritium. Right. Still has one proton, but now has two neutrons. One plus two equals three. Okay. Um, most of the elements in the periodic table are composed in nature uh, a majority of one isotope. There are a couple of exceptions like chlorine. Chlorine is composed about equally of two different isotopes. Um, let's see. Let me not digress too far. I want to stay on, on course. Okay, well, I left out this one. This one is the, um, how many? There's no symbol for that. How many of these do you have? Right? In this case, you got two of each. But in a compound, you may want to designate two hydrogens and one oxygen. Okay? If there's just one, we don't write the one. Okay. Um, so let's see, all right, so we know what mass number is, <coughs> but there's a difference between mass number that's not equal to atomic mass, okay, those are two different numbers. Mass number is always a whole number because it's the summation of the number of protons and the number of neutrons. But atomic mass is a weighted average. Average of all naturally occurring. I always forget. 
two C's. Two R's. Two R's. Two N's. Yeah. Naturally occurring isotopes. That's a weighted average. So everybody knows how to calculate your GPA, right? You know that uh, classes with four hours, like this one, uh, carry more weight against a grade that you get here than a class that only has three or only has one. Similar concept with atomic mass. <clears throat> but what we need in order to do this, this is simply just counting numbers of protons and number of neutrons. This one is actually assigning a mass to the parts. Okay? So what was done was we needed a standard, something that we could fix as a, as a absolute. And then everything else is related to that. That's our standard. It used to be oxygen. They used to say, Oxygen in the um, in the natural state is equal to 32, and they call it atomic mass units. Right? But they didn't know that it was O2. Right? So that's mm -hmm. kind of iffy. Plus, gases are harder to isolate and use as a mass standard right? because you need a container. <clears throat> so they did away with that one and replaced it with carbon. And in fact, they replaced it with the carbon, let's see, that was one isotope. This is with the carbon, oh, excuse me, wrong place. The carbon-12 isotope. Okay. So if you have uh, one atom of this isotope, you have six protons, six neutrons. That's where the 12 comes from. This one is fixed at 12, however many zeros you want. Atomic mass units, okay? So everything else is compared to that. So any other isotope that you look at, even carbon-13 or carbon-14, the radioactive one that's used for carbon dating. Uh, their atomic mass units won't be exactly 13. The mass number is 13, but the atomic mass is not 13 because it's related to this one that's fixed. So, um, let's see, here we go. So, this being fixed, we're going to have to weight the contribution of the numbers of each of these isotopes in nature so that we can slap a value on the periodic table. And those numbers on that table are in the upper left-hand corner of each of those squares. And they're all fractions. Even for carbon, they're fractions because that number represents the contribution of this one, that one, primarily. This one's, uh, this one's only very small percent, so we just ignore it. We're gonna use these two because they're the major components. I think that's right. No, O1. So we're, gonna, we're just gonna ignore that one. Now, if you were doing this for a living, like you, you work for the uh, National Institutes of Standards and Testing, you take every isotope into consideration. In fact, this is not the only number of isotopes that are characteristic of carbon. Most of them have lots of them. But you can look them up. Normally, I don't recommend Wikipedia for serious research, but for general information, you just Go to Wikipedia and look up any of the isotopes, say carbon isotope, or, uh, oxygen isotopes, or gold isotopes, or whatever. Then they'll give you a list of them, and they'll tell you which ones are stable. I think that information is accurate. And the others, 
they'll they'll give you the mechanism for its decay. They usually consider only the, the ones that are high enough percent to be a value uh, and stable. Because the radioactive ones, I mean, once you get the measurement done, it's changed. So they usually leave the radioactive ones out. And they're generally a small percentage anyway, unless they only have radioactive ones. And then what they do is they only report the most abundant ones. Right? So if you look on the chart, um, you'll see down here toward the bottom, yeah, just that bottom row. Those numbers, those are whole numbers in parentheses. That's because um, they don't live long enough and all of the isotopes are radioactive. Right? So they just report the most abundant one for those that have no stable isotopes. PM, see PM there? Uh, Lanthanides, fourth one over to the right, kind of a hollowed out. That's uh, promethium. I was looking for plutonium. Oh, there it is. Uh, two to the right of uranium. Plutonium is a man made element. And it's radioactive. So when they put um, uh, uranium in a reactor, if they choose the mixture right, they can convert some of that uranium, not the radioactive uranium, but the other isotopes, convert some of that into plutonium. Then when the reactor is finished with that fuel, they reprocess it and extract the plutonium. And there you have uh, makings of a bomb or you can put it in another reactor. Those are called breeder reactors. They actually make more fuel than you put into them. It's kind of weird that way. Anyway, <clears throat> okay, back to this topic. <clears throat> so we're only going to use these two to uh, calculate the weighted average of atomic mass or carbon. So this carbon, let's go over here and do our calculation. Will there be a lot of calculations and stuff on the exam? Like from chapter one, chapter two, chapter three? There'll be some. Ch ch oh, there'll be some chapter yeah, there'll be some. Right, you remember how to do um, significant figures. Okay. Um, if you worked all the uh, homework problems, you should do it. Okay. Right. Just don't want to get in there and then be like hit upside the head with some math and be like, uh oh. Okay, so if uh, we're going to have, we want the weighted average of the two most common isotopes of carbon, and this one is 98.89% of uh, abundance, and this one, which is also stable, is 1.11%, I believe. That's a lot smaller. Yeah, a whole lot smaller. But that's why, when you look on the periodic table, the value that's reported is 12.01. Some, some, some. It's, 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 this one's a little bit heavier than that one, so it contributes a slight amount of mass to the average. So you just say, what is the contribution of this one? Well, actually what it is, is 12, whatever, 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 times the fractional amount. Because percent is a dimensionless number. If we use 98.89 times that, then um, instead of getting 12.01, we'd get 12,001. So we get, yeah, 12,010. <laughs> and that would work. We need, what's the fractional amount of this contribution, which is 0.9889? And this one 
we have to use the value for that atomic mass related to this one. And it's not 13. It's uh, 0034. Okay. Then we use the fractional amount. There. Okay. So this is the only one that, that has uh, the exact number 12. The rest of them are related to that, so this one's going to be different. And then we take the, the values of that calculation. Okay. 0.9889. We all times that. So this one's 11.867. These are atomic mass units. So that's the contribution of this abundance of carbon 12 to the total naturally occurring carbon. And this one is one more one. This one is zero point one four four three. See Again, 12.0113 as the weighted average or the atomic mass, the average atomic mass of naturally occurring carbon. Now, these guys, some of these guys uh, do this for a living, and they will periodically go back and check multiple natural sources of carbon on the earth and adjust these numbers based on that is as fixed. The rest of them, they'll adjust them for every element. And then they'll publish uh, a new periodic table with modified values. They'll never change uh, above the second decimal. That's why I only use two decimals. Because I know it'll never change that, that far up. Down here, they'll change these numbers way over here. That seems so tedious that mm -hmm. you did a whole PR table based on just the isotopes and yeah. stuff. Yeah, uh, that's why. Let's see, let's so let's with each one. one of those, you said there's like at least one or two other isotopes with them? Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. And you have to do all of that? Mm -hmm. it, it's really not as bad as it used to be. Oh, there was a worse way of doing it? Yeah, I mean, you had to do it um, using wet chemistry. But now they have um, devices called mass spectrographs. And you can, all you need to be certain of is that your sample is pure. Like it only has carbon in it. Then when you put it through the instrument, it will count the number of atoms and ratio them. Okay. Well, that's neat. That is a little Yeah, I think there was, I had a picture in here. Maybe I didn't in this one. No, I didn't give you a picture. Maybe there's one in your book of a mass spectrograph. Now that we have electronics that are fast enough, they can detect individual strikes on the detector of individual atoms. You can also read this. It's today's lab. <clears throat> uh, they're not cheap, of course, but if you work for the government, you know, money like it grows on trees. Okay, so that's how we calculate each one of those um, atomic masses that are reported for each of the elements, a weighted average of the naturally occurring isotopes. And the next topic, periodic table. Okay. How is the periodic table organized? Well, 
It didn't just happen overnight, right? There were a number of scientists that were involved uh, as early as the, the uh, 18th century, early 18th century. They noticed that some elements uh, had similar chemical characteristics. They behaved similarly. When you react and with react this element with that reagent, and you take uh, another element, different element, react it. They behave similarly. Right? So they noticed those trends, and the first trends trends they came up with were called triads. We didn't know all the elements on the periodic table, so there weren't that many to to associate with one another. So the best they could do at that point was triads. There's three in this group, three in this group, and they behave similarly. Eventually, we noticed that, uh, you know, scientists noticed, and the one that's given credit for putting the periodic table together was uh, Mendel, uh, yeah, Mendeleev. Dimitri, by name. You need a copy of today's lab? Yes, please. Um, and what he did was he put the elements in groups, called them families, we call them groups now. And on the periodic table, the groups are the verticals. Right? So everything in the vertical, in a column, particularly for the representative elements. Let me get a point out there. You're not going to see that on the recording. So all of these behave similarly. These behave similarly. These, they're all groups, families. Transition metals, these guys in here. Um, some of them are similar, some of them are not. So these first two columns, well, let me back up. The main, the major division, once you've got them set in their columns, the major division is this red line right here. That divides nonmetals from metals. So most of the elements in the periodic table are metals. Have a few non-metals, um, and then you have the, the groups, right, like that. But you also have left to right. These are called periods, left to right. Sometimes, in fact, in your text, you might see uh, these two columns and these six columns are known as representative elements. But each column may have a, a, a name of its own. And I'll tell you about those in a minute. <clears throat> but uh, from left to right is called a period. And other scientists, including Mendeleev, have recognized that when you go from left to right, you increase in weight, right? The mass increases left to right. This, this calculated average mass increases um, and the, the uh, chemical characteristics and physical properties of the elements change from left to right. But once you get down to, to the end on this chart, if you try to go over here and say, wait a minute, the element that I would put over here, it looks a whole lot like these guys. So I'll put it back over here. So that's why it's a period. It goes down, circles back, starts over again. Anybody here have physics? Or periodic motion? Periodic motion, think pendulum. Any type of motion that goes through a cycle and returns to its original position is periodic. So that's why this is called periodic, a period, because it goes down here and doubles back, starts over again. Okay. So periods are the rows and families or groups are the columns. And some of them have names, right? If you did the uh, uh, periodic table, you know, fill out the periodic table, then you already know that this first one is alkali metals. 
Second one is alkaline earths. These groups in here are transition metals. Uh, they would go back over here. These are noble gases. These are the halogens. Right? So if you have an older car like mine, the headlamp might be a halogen bulb right? instead of an LED. These are the calcogens, named at, it's an archaic term for uh, oxygen compounds. The calcogens, these are the nitrogens, starts with a P, but the P is silent. And then the rest of them don't have names. Well, at least not the columns here. These are called lanthanides, simply because the first one in the row is lanthanum. And this whole row right here squeezes right into that place right there. And the reason we do, we pull it out, is so that we don't have a periodic chart that's a mile long. It just makes it more compact. Then the actinides here, they go right below the lanthanides right there. So you'll notice that we go from uh, 88 to 104. So where did all they go? Well, we pulled them out and put them over here. So 90 through 103 is here. And then you come back up and start over. Now it's not, uh, it was convenient to do it that way, but as it turns out, when we study, well, we probably won't study it very deeply here, but if you study the uh, electronic structure of atoms, how you build an atom, uh, one proton and one electron pair at a time, you, you make your individual elements, you'll find that uh, this group fills a certain orbital with electrons, these fill a different orbital, these fill a different orbital, and these fill a different orbital, higher level. So there's a lot to the periodic table that's not explicit. But once you learn where everything is, uh, you can do a lot with it. Okay, stop me anytime if you have questions. Uh, okay, now, uh, the other numbering system, the, the periods, left to right, rows, this is the first period, it only has two, hydrogen and helium. And then the second period has eight, two on this side and six on that side. And the third has eight. Yeah. The fourth has uh, a 18. Right. And then 18 more in this one. But they're numbered from top to bottom, down to seven. And then uh, the columns are numbered now IUPAC. The International Union of Pure and Applied Chemists decided uh, we'd rather just have numbers from left to right. One, two, three, four, all the way across the 18. Okay. The older system is given here underneath, the AB system. 1A, 2A, then over here 3A, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Well, that's zero, but some charts say Roman numeral 8. Um, that's useful if you're talking about representative elements and the octet. If you have any courses, like biology courses or anatomy courses, they give you a little, little quick, fast and in a hurry blurb about chemistry. They might mention the octet. That just means eight. Eight electrons completes an outer shell, a valence shell. Those are the electrons that are available for chemical reaction, right? So if you start over here, this one only has one. This one has two. This one has three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons. Once you get to eight, there's no reaction because it's full. That's why the noble gases don't react. They're happy. They've got all the electrons they need in their valence shell. They don't want any more. They're not going to give any up. So. They just don't play with anybody. Uh, okay, so periodic table, let's see if I covered up on basis here. You can read about the characteristics of metals and nonmetals. And I mentioned the dividing line between uh, nonmetals and metals. Um, let's see. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Right, we haven't got some naming compounds yet. So we won't talk about that. So that comes into the next exam. Call it nomenclature. 
big word for just name the compound correctly. Um, now there is some discussion about uh, building an atom. Okay, so we better do that. All right. So when we when we put an atom together and we start building it, remember if we add a proton, we've got a different element. Add another proton, another element. <coughs> All right. So as we add the, the protons here and uh, the neutrons just depend upon the isotope. So when you're actually building an atom, you're not too concerned about the neutrons. Only about the number of protons. Consequently, the neutral atom will have the same number of neutrons. But in order to account for its chemistry, how it behaves in a reaction, we need to know how many of these are and where are they in this region. I say where in quotes because we really don't know where they are. It's all probabilities. <clears throat> but we have a, a system, let me put it that way, we have a system for accounting for all of our electrons. The, um, okay, so the, the first number, uh, if we're going to write an electronic configuration, For an element, we need to know how many protons and consequently how many electrons. So we need to know that value. And um, we need to agree upon the fact that when we have a nucleus down here, the closer you are to the nucleus, the lower the energy of the electron. The farther you get away from the nucleus, the higher the energy. So that's why when you, when you shine, uh, say, uh, an ultraviolet light on some elements, uh, or even visible light, uh, you will, sometimes you'll kick off an electron. That's where photoelectric cells come from, the photoelectric effect, which was described in, I think it was 1921, uh, was explained sufficiently by Isaac Newton. The other smart guy, Albert Einstein. <laughs> Albert Einstein wrote uh, a paper on the uh, photoelectric effect and explained mathematically in, in proofs how that process occurred. And he did it so well, he won a Nobel Prize for it. Everybody thinks he got one for relativity. No, he got one for photoelectric effect. Uh, but the, the, the point is that if the electron is closer to the nucleus, it's low energy. Away from the nucleus, it's higher energy. So we have these, uh, what we call, what do they call them? Electron shell. And we designate it with some number. Right? And in that case, um, we're saying N without the zero. And these numbers will just run whole numbers from one on up. And they correspond generally with the periods, right? So this is one energy level, and this is the next highest, and this is the next highest, okay? And as we add electrons into the atom, we have to put them into the lowest available energy. So if there's only one proton for hydrogen, that first electron goes there in that first energy level. Okay. But if we add another proton, like for helium, right, we have two protons, then we have two electrons, right, and they can both go in that number one energy level. At this point, it's full. That's all you can put in number one. Okay, so we have that, and then each one of these can be subdivided. And I think they call them uh, subshells. So each one of these has subshells. So if we have this one, 
the only subshell it can have is designated with an S. Okay? For two, you can have an S subshell, right? similar to this one, but not the same, because you're at a different energy level, right? You're moving up energy level. This one can have an S and a P. For three, you can have an S, a P, and a B. Okay. Um, so these are the subshell letters, and there's one more. You can have S, P, D, yeah. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, at each one of these levels, depending on Notice that for, if this is one, you can only have one of these. This is two, you can have two. Three, you can have three. Four, you can have four. So if there's only one available, you start with S. If you're in the second one, then you can have access to S and P. And if you're in the third shell, you have access to three subshells, S, P, and D. And then four. Um, and then we know how many electrons can be fit uh, into each one of these. And they're called orbitals. So we have a shell and then subdivided each one of those subshells and then each one of the subshells can have multiple orbitals. The S's can only have one orbital and each orbital can only have two electrons. That's why the S can only have two. That's one. One S can only have two electrons. So you have uh, one orbital which means two electrons. But if you have a P, S and a P, you can have, uh, you have three orbitals, and each one of those can have two, so you can have six electrons, the P's. Okay. For the D's, you can have five orbitals. Each one of those can have two, so it becomes five as 10. And then for the F's, you can have seven orbitals in that subshell. And seven times two is 14. Okay? Now, let's take this and say, all right, with two electrons, say we're in this period, plus three, we have three, so we have S, P, and D available. So we can have three. This, these are your filling the S orbital. So you can go one in the S orbital, three S orbital, and you can have two in the three S orbital. It's full. So now you go across the period. Now we're in the P's, three P's, <laughs> right? And P's, you can have, you have three orbitals with six electrons possible. So we're gonna add six electrons, all right? So if we put one in, there's, there's the P1, P2, P3, P4, five, six, P4. Right. So this is where the octet comes from. Two plus six is eight. Now you might be wondering where the Ds fit in. All these guys right here are Ds. But this, the way they fill up, these Ds are not available until this S is full, the 4S. So that's why when you go to 4, you have 4S1 and 4S2, then you go backwards to 3D1, 2, 3, 4, all the way over 10, 3D10. Okay. And I'm gonna give you a, a, a little, uh, I think it's, it's in here too. A little method that 
you can use to know the order. Right? So they're not numerically in, in order once you get up in this region. <coughs> okay? Because the, as you add more protons and electrons, the energy levels shift, they overlap. Right? So it gets really complicated. So that's why you need this little device to help you know which one comes next. Okay. So that brings me to the topic of shorthand. So how do we identify shorthand subshells? Okay. So first you put the shell number, then you put the subshell letter, and then you put how many electrons there are in it. So 1s2 means helium, because it only has two electrons. Then you go to the next level, because that's as far as you can go with one. It only has s's, just like that. So if we go to this one, you can have s's and p's, so two s's and two p's. Okay. So if we fill this one up, and we fill this one up, we have 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I think that's probably neon, right? The noble gas neon would be this would be your electronic structure. Okay. Now, so that I don't forget to put this in here, remember I said it has three orbitals. So if you know need to know how those are filled up, let's say we don't have six. Let's say we only have four. Which element would that be? Four, five, six, seven, eight. What has an eight atomic number? Oxygen, right? Oxygen. So this is oxygen. And you have four electrons that fit into these three. Well, the rule says that you have um, each one of these orbitals can have two electrons in it. Right? That's why three times two is six. And they have to have opposite spins. Right, so that's that's the number I didn't give you. It's either plus one half or minus one half. You don't have to remember that. Just know that they're opposite spins. So you can put two electrons in here if they spin the opposite direction. But you can't put them together until you put at least one in each one of these. So go one, two, three. Okay, we got four, so we can go back and put the fourth one like that. Spin up, spin down. Okay. Knowing this information helps explain some of the chemical and physical properties of elements. When we talk about periodic trends, you know, how does um, atomic radius, you know, how big is the atom? How does it vary across the table? Or electronegativity, how is it? How does it attract electrons? And it's a trend across the table that way too. And this helps explain glitches in that trend. Okay, so this is our shorthand. You put the shell first, then the suborbital, and if necessary, the orbitals, subshell, excuse me, uh, shell, subshell, and orbitals if necessary. But this is the, the electronic configuration of an atom. How you build it. Okay, so now I need to show you um, how to put them in the correct order. Right. So uh, I think there's actually a, a diagram in here. Yeah, it's on page eight, top right hand. So if we if we if we write the all the uh, shell subshell combinations in sort of a a list, okay, and three can have what three s three p three d, and then four can have four s four p four d. F, and five can have S, P, D, F. You can actually go up higher than that, G, 
pH. All that. But <coughs> we don't need them, right? Because there are not enough elements in the periodic table to get into the, the G's and the higher. Unless you add energy and promote electrons. And then these are all uh, theoretical. They're not actually observed. The theory, the quantum theory that uh, gives rise to this scenario, this uh, electronic structure, is purely mathematical and probabilistic. But it helps explain uh, atomic behavior. Right? So it's, it's valid as long as it continues to explain things. So if we go to 6, S, 6P, 6D, 6F, 7, S, 7P, I think we can stop there. So you've got your um, electronic configuration, all your shells and subshells written. Now, to know the order that you fill them, you draw diagonals. So you fill that one first, and you fill this one, and you fill those two. So 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, and then you go back to 4s. Then you can go to 3d. Like that. That's the order that you fill them. <clears throat> now, if you know how the periodic table is, is structured, you don't need to know that. You have access to a periodic table, you just look, all right, where's my element? Let's say nickel. 28. Okay. So nickel has 28 protons, so it has 28 electrons, the neutral atom. Okay. So if we use this scenario, we would say 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, uh, 3p6, 4s2, and 3D, let's see how many we've used so far. 2, 4, 10. Here's 10 more, 20. So we need 20, we need 8 more. How many can D hold? 10. Right? So we got room here for the last 8. So that's the configuration for nickel based upon this scenario. Okay? But if you know your periodic table, you know that um, 1s fills here, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, we're up here, and then 3s, and then 4s, before you go back, and these, you just back up one level. Instead of 4d, this is 3d. So 4s, 3d. And then you go back up to 4p if you have to go that far. So if you went to this one, say 5s, then this would be 4d filling. And back to 5p. Okay. That's how the table is structured. And you can, you can write that without using that. You just follow along. Knowing what happens when you get to this point, you got to back up one number. See, it's not four, it's three. Three D. All the D's are filled in here. All the P's filled here. All the S's filled here. And all the F's are filled down here. But we're not going to get we're not going to get to any of those because they uh, those glitches I was talking about. You get several of them down there. So we're not going we're not going to deal with those. And actually, you get some glitches in here, too. But I, I'm going to, my intention is, if I give you one of those to do, it's going to be one that is straightforward. 
Okay, another shorthand that we are permitted to use is we incorporate um, noble gas configuration as a core. So notice, if we go up to here, what does that look like? 2, 4, 10, 18. Looks like argon, doesn't it? So if we do this, argon, and that's, uh, what, what did I say, 8? 18? Yeah, 18. And then whatever's beyond argon, well, if you get to argon, go back, double back over here, that's 4s. So you got 4s2 there, definitely. And then you're walking across the three Ds, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Two, three, eight. Now you got your electronic configuration. This is known as the core. These are known as valence. These are the electrons that are available for reaction, the valence electrons. All right. Um, let's see. We're good on time. Uh, okay, we covered that already. Covered that. Covered that. We have some concept questions at the end. Is the exam pretty like even or is there like one section that's got a lot more stuff um, about it or that we should probably like look out for? I mean, it's, <laughs> it's been a. Oh, I know which chapter or I made mean, all these things up before the semester started. Yeah. So I have to go back and look to answer your question. <laughs> This one does have a bonus section. Oh, well, nice. So you have, uh, let me see how many points it's worth. You have 41 required points and 14 bonus. Oh, that's that just means that the 41, when I do the calculation, 41 is in the denominator. So if you get all 41 points correct in the required section plus some bonus, it could be exceeding 100%. Like that. That's the bonus questions. Um, they're usually a little bit more difficult, um, but uh, depending on how your brain's firing that day, some of the bonus questions might come easier than the others. I've had students tell me that. That's one of the reasons I put the bonuses in there, because on any given day. Uh, I mean, the bonus <clears> don't have any stress. For like, you don't get it, well, that's, it's not like you're getting right. punished uh, for it. No. Right? Uh, but no, not like a standardized SAT or ACT test where they count at like a quarter point for guessing. Wrong. Mm -hmm. I don't do that. Let's see. Okay. There's some calculation, yeah. We know, you know all your prefixes? or units, like uh, milli, before a unit means one thousandth of that value, so millimeter would be one thousandth of a meter. And how many millimeters in a meter? Well, it takes a thousand of them, because they're tiny. Okay, things like that. Kilo, the other way, a thousand times. So a gram is this big, and a kilogram is this big. Okay. <coughs> so know your prefixes. Know how to do your. Uh, you you, if you haven't read through the chapter, you need to do it at least once. Because anything's fair game. I mean, uh, facts that come up. Most must most students are pretty good at remembering just general facts. It's when you start having to do critical thinking. That's, that's what trips you up. Solving problems, that's 
one of the critical thinking techniques is solving problems. Um, you need to know your rules, right, for, for solving, uh, not solving, for, for doing significant figure calculations. Right? There are two rules, right? One for add, subtract, one for multiply, divide. And if you have combinations in a calculation, which ones do you do first? Parentheses, if there are any. Exponents, next. Multiply, divide, add, subtract. So if the parentheses are not there to guide you, then you take these in that order. Any multiplications, do them all first. Divisions, do them first. Then you can add, subtract. But if the parentheses are there, then you do everything inside the parentheses first. On the significant figures, just to double check, if you've got like decimals, mm -hmm. which I assume we will, uh, if there's one that has like four places and then there's one that has two, you go with the bigger number, right? Is your significant number in the end? So if you, have if, you end, if you end up with like a real big long like after the calculation, after the calculation, if your answer is like some big long thing, you go with the biggest. Well, not necessarily. Not necessarily. So if you have this one, how many of these are significant? Three. Mm -hmm. right. You multiply that times right. you get a number. Which one determines how many you can keep? That one. Just three. So whatever you get down here, you have to limit it to three significant figures. Right. You count from the left. Over three and round with our rule. Yeah, I'm going to go back over this. Yeah, better, better review. Yeah. If you have a number like this, how many significant figures? Two. Because there's no decimal. How about this one? Three because there is a decimal. If there's a decimal, zeros to the right are significant. Zeros to the left are never significant. Leading zeros are never significant. Uh, if there's a zero that's bracketed, it's always significant. So that's four significant figures. Scientific notation, got that down? Yeah. Love that that one's easier for me to grasp than the significant figures. Yeah. Now, if you're going to do a, a calculation that has only multiply divide in it, you just do the multiply divides all the way through, keep as many decimals as your calculator will give you. Then at the end, you look back at your uh, components and find the least significant figures and then round your answer. The reason we do that is to avoid rounding errors. You don't round intermediates, unless you're forced to. If you have add subtracts in there that you have to do, then you got to get those done first because right, they come before multiply divide and then you can keep your decimals after that so you might have a combination that you need to do remember when when you do add subtract you just line up the decimals actually you line up the significant figures right. i showed you this one right. three one zero and then one five seven How do we round that one? Because that's not significant, we have to round it to that position. So that was bad. So we round this one to four, seven, zero. Gives us, and it's just coincidence that this has two and that has two. What you're looking for is how far to the right can you go? 
Now, if you have if you have explicit decimals in there, it's easier. I choose to line up the decimals, and then how far to the right can you go with your significant figures? And you stop at the least one. This works better. I think really that's all the questions I have. Okay. Anybody, any latecomers have uh, uh, assignments you want to turn in? Lab, assi lab assignments is all there is. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, sure. Anybody else? You need just the chapter three. You got the others already. No, it's, it's more like I go to check my phone every once in a while, make sure nobody's on like, message me like, oh, you need to go pick up your brother or something, or your niece from school versus if you know, something like that. And then I look and it's like a telemarker. I'm like, wow, thank you. Never already done like five. Just this morning. Yeah. Today is just like my lucky day. Sounds like a campus. So, I've been to the one. I have a grade for you already. Yeah, with the graphing techniques. Yeah. Did you submit it? Yeah, but my, uh, I didn't know if you got it or not. I didn't know if I could. I need a one. Okay. I can even access it. Oh. Yeah. I, are they? They promised you they'd fix it? Uh -huh. Okay. Lab technique. Okay. Oh, does anybody else need to? I, I gave, as you came in, I gave you uh, density lab, right? I got, you need a density? That's the one we're doing today. Short term memory loss. Okay. Let's see how we're doing on time. Okay, we're good. All right, so that's really an overview of the chapter you missed. Thank you. And open the floor to any other problems that you might be having. Do you have No. No, never round first. Right. Um, let me make one. Let me make one up. Um, a, a complex one. Let's say we have um, got. Uh, Parentheses. So, so the parentheses takes precedence. We do this calculation first. So you take that number. You want to line up the decimals and those together, and then you say you can only go to the right one decimal. We have to round to this position. The one just drops out. So now this value is 28.8 for multiplying. 
multiply the by. Now you can go in and say, uh, multiply this one times that one, divide by this one. And then uh, how, how are we limited in our answer? Well, this one has five significant figures. This one has three, so those don't count. And this one has three. So we're limited to three significant figures in the multiply divide phase of this calculation. So if we say 28.8 times 0.0953 and divide by 150.4, I guess. Actually, uh, I'm configured to spit out in scientific notation, but I probably ought to keep this in standard notation. So let me see. I can do this in my head. That's everything that my calculator gave me. But I have to limit it to three significant figures. So since these two don't count, I say one, two, three. So that's five or greater. That means this one has to be rounded to three. 0 0.0183 is my answer. Okay. Now, without these parentheses, what would we do? Well, no parentheses, no exponents, multiply, divide first. Let's see what that would do to the answer. Let's see. The answer for this one is 0183. Put it over here. Okay, now let's do it without the parentheses. Say we've left the parentheses out. And now we have to go to the, the rules. All right. So no parentheses, no exponents, multiply. Multiply these two together because they're closest in proximity. 25.1 and 0.0953 is 2.39203. Now, before we can do anything else, because this is an add subtract, well, actually. I didn't see this one coming. I just got hit by a train. <laughs> so what do I do now? <laughs> Once I get this number, so that's uh, three significant figures, three, so we have to round it to here. And since that's two, those just go away. So it's 2.39. So now, you can't resolve this fraction because there's an add up here. Right? Think that's the way it goes. Let's see. You can't say this divided by that and then add that because this is not in the same region as that. So the PEMDAS rules uh, are valid for the numerator only in this case. So now you have to take 2.39 and 3.71, which should be easy now. So it's 6.10. So now we have these together, 6.10 divided by 150.3. And we still limited to three significant figures. So it's 0 0.04057474. Three significant figures of these three. Seven is greater than five. So this becomes zero and four of six. So you get a completely different answer. That's why parentheses are good. <laughs> and that's why uh, algebraic calculators have to have parentheses. Because they work the same way as this. Whereas my calculator doesn't, it works differently. I don't need parentheses at all, ever.
Okay. More information that you wanted, maybe. Okay. Anything else? Let's see. Most abundant element in the universe based on the number of atoms. Then comes helium. In fact, where was helium first discovered? I think I mentioned so, um, in the sun, yeah. Uh, how about, how about the, uh, the Earth's crust? What's the most abundant element in the Earth's crust? Not the whole Earth, just the crust. I mean, nitrogen is popping out of me, but I really don't think that's right. That's the atmosphere. That's the atmosphere, yeah. yeah. In the crust. Yeah. Oxygen. Now, there's, there's a interpretation. I'm not sure if they mean the Earth's crust, the solid part only, but as it turns out, whether they mean the solid part of the crust or whether they mean include the oceans, oxygen is still the most abundant. If it's, they include the oceans, yeah, definitely, because it's because of water. Yeah. But most uh, elements, um, metals and nonmetals, as you find in the crust, are combined with oxygen in some form. That's why we have to, we have to smelt our metals iron, we get the iron ores, iron oxide, aluminum, aluminum oxide, bauxite, two that come to mind. Uh, some of them are sulfides, like copper. Copper you can find as an oxide and a sulfide in its ore. Now, gold, platinum, palladium, they're noble metals. In other words, you're you can find them combined, but you, you also find them uncombined. That's why those, uh, what's that show with the, 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 the people in Alaska and Canada, they show uh, mining for gold, surface mine. Oh, yeah. Gold Rush. Gold Rush, that's it. Yeah, Gold Rush. That's why they can do that, because gold is found as the pure metal. And it's very dense, so all you have to do is, is run it through your sluice, and everything else is usually lighter than gold. So it, it falls through the cracks and collects in that mesh that they've got there. Most of it's really fine grain. Occasionally they'll find a big nugget. Okay. I'm just trying to think of things that. Mark your memory. What's a molecule? Combination. Combination of two or more atoms. Right. So this is a molecule. This is a molecule. This is a homoatomic. Molecule, because it only has one element, but there's more than one of them. Um, phosphorus occurs like that. Uh, sulfur occurs like that. So those are homoatomic molecules. This is heteroatomic. Because it has two or more different elements in it different types of atoms. Uh, let's see.
no difference between uh, precision and accuracy. I just always think of it with darts. With bullseye. How about uh, conversion factors? Remember how to use conversion factors? That's going to be a big deal throughout the entire course. Conversion factors. What do you need? If you need a conversion factor, what do you have to have? Something equal to something else. You need an equality, right? So one foot equals 12 inches. Now you've got a conversion factor. All you have to do is say, is convert that equal to one. Right. So divide through by 12. That equals one. This is equal to one. Remember, all conversion factors are equal to one. That's why you can multiply anything by a conversion factor. Um, it, it's valid because it's always equal to one. So in this case, where could we use that one? We could only use this one if uh, we have so many inches. And we want to convert that to feet. And the reason we can only use in this form is because that's in the numerator. This is in the denominator. And units behave just like numbers. You can cancel them, you can multiply them together. In this case, we want to cancel inches, leave us with feet. Then you do the math, like 12 is 144, so that's 12 feet. Okay. What if we had feet over here? Feet divided by 12 is 144. 12 divided by uh, 144 divided by 12. When you put it in your calculator, you want to put in 144, hit the divide number, then put in 12, hit the equal. That's probably, right? everybody here has algebraic calculators. But if you've got 12 feet and you want to make inches, then you need a conversion factor to cancel feet and leave you with inches. So this is where you're headed, and this is where you came from. So that these will cancel. Then you put in the relationship. So it's 12 inches in one foot. Now 12 times 12 is 144. We can still use that conversion factor. We just invert it. Because what's the inverse of 1? Well, let's see. Let's invert 1. So if we want to take the inverse of 1, we say divide that into 1, right? Which is 1. So you still got 1. So you, that's why you can, you can flip it as needed. So that's the basics of conversion factors. You can also chain conversion factors together. I'll show you the example of uh, how much it's going to cost to go from here to Atlanta. Yeah, you need to know how far is it? What's the mileage in your car? I mean miles per gallon. And then what's the cost per gallon of gasoline? Right. So you get, you get miles. Let me see how far it is. It's about 485 miles. Say your car gets how many miles per gallon? I don't know. Let's keep it simple. Say 20. You're lucky. Maybe you drive an efficient V8. 20 miles per gallon. In this case, some miles to cancel and you leave you gallons, right? You still haven't got to what you want, right? Money. <coughs> so you got to convert gallons to dollars. Gallons cancel. So what's the relationship? Well, now let's see. If you can stop at Sam's Club on the way there. Okay. 
Now you got dollars in this account. We, we chained our conversion factors together. And that's perfectly valid. As long as you keep track of your units, how they cancel, how they're left over, that otherwise known as dimensional analysis. These are the dimensions. And they dictate the path that you take to the answer. And that's one way, right? So if you want to get home, you double it. If you want to do it. Yeah, that's all it was. Multiply, divide. So if they're if they're in the numerator, you can multiply this times that times that times that. Then take that answer, divide by that, divide by that, divide by that. Some students, I use parentheses, but some students like pick a sentence. So you can put uh, 485 miles here, and then you can say right, 20 miles per gallon there, and then you can say that. Right, if that if that keeps it straighter in your in your mind, picket fence works okay too. You just know that this is the numerator, that's in the denominator, right? So it can't. And leaves you with dollars. Okay. And to do that calculation, you say this times that equals, and then you get the times key again. No, you don't. You get the divide key. Okay. That times that. Actually, you, you don't even have to get the equals. You can say that times that divided by that equals answer. And when you do uh, conversion like that, the nice thing about it is um, if keeping track of significant figures in your answer is multiply, divide, rule only. That's all you have to deal with, with conversion factors. Um, now, if you have, um, if you're converting temperatures, then you have um, Fahrenheit equals centigrade, oh, excuse me, but uh, converted. And then this centigrade plus 32, or 1.8, same thing. So this is a, a, just a formula for converting one to the other. And if you if you know Fahrenheit and you want to get centigrade, you have two options. You can plug the number in and then solve for this one, or solve for this one first, and then plug the number in. It works either way. Now, if you have Fahrenheit, given Fahrenheit, and the question is, what is that in Kelvin? You got to go through this first. Because Fahrenheit and Kelvin are related. <coughs> uh, so you say, uh, plug in Fahrenheit, solve for centigrade. And then this one is whatever your answer is there, plus 273. Okay. And like any formula, if you have values for all the variables except for one, you can solve it. The only ones that give you trouble is if you have you have uh, three or more variables and you got two unknowns. One equation, two unknowns, you can't solve it. Now, related equations, if you've got two equations and two unknowns, you can solve it. Like, remember that from algebra? <laughs> Wasn't that, wasn't that fun? Yeah. I've, I've had uh, three equations and three of them. Same yeah. procedure, just takes longer. I, I remember those taking like forever though. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I can't. Once you get past two, it's <laughs> take up like 30 you some know, pages because I know I'd mess up somewhere. The one I can't remember how to do is um, square roots by hand. I reviewed it recently, so I think I could probably figure it out. But you can do square roots by hand. I don't want to. No. 
and I'd rather use my calculator. In fact, before I had a calculator, I had a slide rule. You ever seen a slide rule? You might have to go to a museum. I may still have one. I bought a real nice one. It was uh, uh, made out of bamboo with a white laminate on the top, and then the, the numbers and so forth. Slide rules are most of the operations you do in a slide rule are based on logarithms. So the scale is not going to be linear. It's going to be a logarithm scale. So if you add, subtract logarithms, you're actually multiplying the divide. But as the joke was around the, I uh, grew up in Atlanta, where we had George Tech downtown Atlanta, and drive through their campus and see all the engineers with these uh, scabbards, leather scabbards hanging on a bell. And uh, prestige was afforded to those with the biggest scabbard because they had the biggest slide rule. <laughs> In those days, my first calculator was made by a company called Bomar. They went out of business, of course. But it was about the same uh, height and width here, but it was like that thick and weighed a ton. And what only do, add, subtract, multiply, divide, and square root. We need to do logs. Still had to keep a log table with me. And it cost a hundred bucks. But now you get one of these. Well, what yours is worth like ten, fifty dollar tops. And actually if you have a smartphone, you now you can't use them in this class. But if you have a smartphone, you can get calculator apps. I've got one that, that uh, emulates my favorite design calculator in my phone. RPM calculator. Okay. That's enough of my, let me see if there's anything else that just jumps out at me. First chapter was all on the basic concepts, elements, compounds, pure substances and mixtures, you know the difference? But pure substance can be an element or a compound. Right. You can have pure water, or you can have a mixture of water and, and sand would be what kind of mixture? Heterogeneous. Uh, water and salt, once it's dissolved, would be a homogeneous mixture, otherwise known as a solution. Uh, solids, liquids, and gases, physical properties, chemical properties versus physical change, chemical change. They are related. Uh, let's see. Units, calculations, and then chapter three we get. So when we study as long as we study the stuff that's going on for a change. I'm sorry? As long as we read the chapter and study the stuff that's on the slides, we should be okay with the kids. Mm, I can't guarantee that. If you've worked all the homework problems, then you'll be good. Yeah. So I, I gave everybody a handout at the beginning, didn't I? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's on Blackboard too, a reproduction of it. So you can test yourself there. I don't know, there might be um, in Blackboard, I don't know if I put uh, a review document in there or not. I may not have since we're working from a different textbook than the other course I teach at this level. Because they, they may not overlap, so I, I probably didn't do that. That's why, that's why I gave you homework problems that are out of your book. Okay, we'll take a short break and reconvene in the lab. Okay. <coughs> this shouldn't take long. In fact, it, it should even be a little fun. What time do you want us back? Oh, um, say 10 minutes from now, be enough time. Oh, we have any smokers? Okay. How long does it take to smoke a cig? Seven minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs>